Happy Valentine's Day. Let's celebrate the magnanimous love of God. And by the way, enhance your worship celebration by tapping into Patrick Grimes' YouTube channel. Join him and then join us for worship. Let's pray. Most gracious, mighty God in heaven, thank you so much for today and the meaning of the day for the celebration of love. Now, we don't need to be told to celebrate love, but Father, we need to practice love on a regular basis. So help us to love our family, those who are dear and special to us, our friends and neighbors, to reach out in, in love all around. And Father, we need to, we also pray for those who are struggling today, who are struggling with finances, uh, struggling with emotions because of um, uh, the being sh shut in. Father, we pray that you would care for each one and help us be able to put our struggles aside just to worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing a love song to God. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art if ever I love thee, my Jesus, it's now. We talk about justice, and we have these particular things in mind. I love... 007, James Bond, and his all his movies, because always James Bond destroys the evil guy. Uh, the evil guy, you know, the guy that's so bad. He's the uh, he's the one who finally gets him destroyed. And what we see is at the end, not only is he destroyed, not only does he die, but he knows he's going to die. And his you can see in his face the agony. Why aren't I the winner? Why aren't I the winner? Uh, same with the Die Hard movies. Same thing. I love to watch those kind of movies because I love to see good win and evil destroyed. And then there's the love movies that we like to watch, the romance, the rom-coms. Uh, Sleepless in Seattle is what I'm thinking of, and how Sam loses his wife and mourns and mourns, and uh, women all over the country because they hear him on radio are wanting to be a part of his life. And one woman chases him down. Her name is Annie. Annie um, goes to interview him but can't get up the nerves to do it. Finally, she gets, um, they finally get to meet. But the problem with the thing is they didn't make me hate Walter enough. I thought he was a very sweet guy, the guy, the guy that she was dating. dating. Uh, I thought he was really sweet, so I didn't feel like there was justice there. If only he had been mean and nasty to her. But everything, they had everything in common. Sam and Annie didn't have everything in common. They didn't know each other. But they fall in love, and it's a wonderful thing, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about justice and how we feel about justice. We're going to take a look at the two sides of justice because we have a particular picture, and God has a different picture. So let's take a look at one passage of Scripture, one verse in 1 Samuel, the 16th verse, the 16th chapter, the 7th verse. It says this, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. And I think that is the whole thing about... God's justice. He's, he's not looking at 
outward appearances. He's not looking at what looks right or, or who, affo- who can afford his justice. He's just simply looking at the heart of the person that is receiving his justice. Okay, So, for example, take a look at Cain in Genesis 4. Cain kills his brother. God doesn't come around and kill him. God lets him live. I think he saw the heart of Cain and that Cain would be more miserable living. In fact, he says, wait a minute. If you, if everyone knows that I'm the killer, then they're going to kill me. I'm going to live my life running away from everybody. And God says, well, I'll put a little mark on you. I don't know what that mark was. Uh, the first tattoo, I don't know. But uh, don't kill, don't kill Cain. Uh whatever it is. Anyway, God lets him go. Then, but God is strict. God is strict in his justice. And along comes uh, Genesis 6, and we find a man named Noah, and God says, you know, I can't stand these human beings anymore. They are just all evil to the core. There is uh, violence, and there is evil just permeating every act that they do. And so I'm going to wipe out humanity. I'm going to need one person that I can trust to to bring this humanity back. And so he calls on Noah, asks Noah to build. Now, notice this, though. By this time, it's got to be like 1,500, 1,500, 1,600 years into humanity's reign on this earth. And... uh, God gave them all that time to turn uh, to not only turn back to him and repent but uh, to fix the situation they were in. They couldn't do it, they didn't do it, and so God rejected them and wiped humanity and all things off the face of the earth to start over again. That's his justice. He could see where it was going and he he could he had to stop it. So he pulls up Jonah, um, Noah, and <laughs> Jonah in the ark. Uh, and pu- pulls up Noah and uh, asks him to do this job. And then he still gives another 120 years while Noah is building the ark for Noah to stop and preach. It's probably why he took so long, because every day he would start out by preaching to people, repent because it's going to rain and God's going to wipe you off the face of the earth. That's why I'm building this thing because God's coming along and he's going to destroy things. God gave him another 120 years with warnings and they still didn't do it. Remember the story in Exodus, the 16th chapter of of uh, when God, when the people were so hungry they were complaining to God you brought us out of Egypt and now you're going to let us starve to death in the desert and God says no I'm not I'm going to send you manna and he says I'm going to send you manna every day so I just want you to take just what's enough for the day for each person each person gets a certain amount and you you will all have that don't take enough for tomorrow because I'll provide the bread for tomorrow what do people do Well, a bunch of them said, I don't trust God. I'm going to go out and grab some more. And what happened the next day? In God's justice, the the manna that they kept for the next day turned to maggots and was ugly and messy and nobody wanted and stunk up the house. Nobody wanted anything to do with it. And God said, you know, see, I've told you, don't get more than you can, than you need for the day. And that kind of is a good teaching for us. And we should understand that we don't need more than we need for the day. Every day, God will take care of us, he says. Then he uh, put out the law. You know, he, he had this law from the very beginning uh, that uh, you should uh, observe the Sabbath day. And worship God on that Sabbath day and relax or relax, stop your work, all kinds of work, no matter what kind of work it is. And as that was finally come down from the Mount, uh, Mount Sinai and things were going on in Numbers, the 15th chapter, we find a man out collecting firewood because he didn't have enough to keep the fire going, to cook up the food and keep uh, everyone warm in the house. So he was out just collecting a little firewood. And God had all the Israelite people stone him to death because he was breaking the Sabbath. 
It was very important. Does that sound like justice to you? I, my heart says, oh, that sounds mean. But you see, God could see the heart of that man. And he could understand that that man was just being rebellious. And so he had the Israelite nations, the Israelites stand up against rebellion so that they would all understand how important it is. Now, I got to tell you, though, the, the way that they stone people is not how we see it, where people are picking up little uh, hand-sized rocks. There was always the first guy who threw the stone. Remember when Jesus said, whoever is sinless, throw the first stone? The first stone was a big rock. And it was to crush the head of the person being stoned. Uh, so that it was a quick death, not a long, slow, pounding death. But um, quick death. Then the rest would throw rocks to, to emphasize what was going on. But God's, God's judgment is always swift and sure. Always important, uh, always something quick. Remember uh, the, the story of uh, Achan in Joshua, the 6th, 7th, and 8th chapters. As Achan was, as the, the, the Israelites were marching around Jericho and they were supposed to go in and they were supposed to wipe everyone out and not touch a thing. Don't grab any goods for the spoils of war, which was the right for people, armies to do. You went in, you won the battle, you grabbed whatever you wanted to for the spoils of war. That was how you got paid for being a warrior, right? Um, but they were not supposed to do that. They were supposed to leave everything where it is and not take it home. But they, a man named Achan uh, found some th trinkets that he thought he really would like and like to have. And who's going to miss them? Nobody's going to miss it. And so what happens is, when they went to fight the, the smaller city of Ai, the Israelites lost. Wait, we just won a big battle at Jericho, and we lose to Ai? What's going on, God? Now no one's going to be afraid of us, because we lost. And God says, yeah, you're right. The problem is, the problem is somebody has cheated in nation and then they have a whole ceremony the next day of everybody every family going by everyone uh, Joshua and they're all finding and finally God points out Achan and his family and Achan says yeah I, I did it I I took some stuff because I didn't think anyone would notice and it wouldn't be that he forgot that God is all, everywhere all the time that God saw him do that and he said yeah it's it's buried under my uh, in the my so, God again had the, all of Israelites stone him to death because it was the wrong thing to do. He was a belligerent man. He wasn't obedient. And that would have had to happen right away. Always God's justice is swift and sure and meets the needs of the community around him, around them, and meets the needs of the of humanity itself. So God's justice is always swift and sure. Always something done. Remember the story of Nadab and Abihu. Nadab and Abihu were high priests, sons of Aaron. And they were the ones who were, they were to light the fire, the altar fire. And there was a specific way and a specific fire they were to use. Uh, but they didn't do that. They decided they would just bring their big click along and uh, light up the fire and that would be fine. And God struck them down with fire from heaven. Boom, just like that. Now then, after that happened, and... and uh, Moses uh, uh, was Aaron's brother, and, and uh, Aaron was so distraught, and Moses was distraught, and so on. And then uh, they said, well, let's, we need to have the next guy. So Aaron's other sons stepped up to be the high priests, the priests of the, uh, of the time. And those priests did something wrong. And Moses said, oh, no, didn't you guys learn? What's the matter? And Aaron said, wait a minute. They are disturbed because they just lost their brothers. And God knew that. God didn't punish them. 
because he knew the hearts of those. So when God punishes, when God disciplines, when God um, fixes situations that are bad, his justice is always swift and sure, always right. You can't challenge it. So then what does he do? There's man's justice. He says, okay, guys, now you have to carry out this justice. You have to be watching for justice. In Genesis, the ninth chapter, after the flood happened, Genesis, the ninth chapter, um, everyone climbs out of the, the boat and they get out and the animals start spreading around and Noah gets one of those um, sheep, the extra sheep that he brought along and those sheep were, he, he uh, offered it on the altar and the altar was um, saying, thank you for getting us here safely and so on. And God says, thank you for noticing Noah and by the way, you see that rainbow in the cloud? That rainbow is, is a promise that I will never flood this, I will never destroy this earth by, by water again. Never wipe out the whole earth with, wa with water. I'm going to leave it alone and encourage you to do that. And by the way, there are a couple things that you're going to notice that we're going to have to do. One is, by, if, if man is shed by the blood of man, if man is killed, if blood is shed by the blood of man, that man will be, his blood would be shed. So this is, you can read this in Genesis, the ninth chapter. And so God is saying, blood for blood. If someone, that, that's the first command of capital punishment. And he says, if, if someone kills somebody, you have to kill them. You have to stop that right there. Pass that judgment along and make it happen. Um... That is emphasized a little later on as God gives Moses those 613 laws. He said, um, oh, by the way, if someone pokes your eye out, you get to poke their eye out. If someone cuts off the, your hand, you get to cut off their hand. If someone, uh, you know, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, all that stuff. And those are limits to what you can do. You can't get even and then more. Like in my family, when you had seven kids riding around in a car, all stuck together in places, dad eventually got a van, but at first we were driving around in, in uh, station wagons. And you got all nine of us inside a station wagon. That was every seat and we were all jam packed tight and everyone would be saying, no, you're too close to me. Get away, get away. We'd fight and struggle and, and uh, beat each other up. And we would always blame the other one. Well, they did it first. Well, they did it first. And then we got it back and it just escalated all the time. Every time we got a chance to escalate, we escalated. And that's what God was worried about. And so he said, limits. You can't, you can't get more than even. You can only get even. Not only did he set limits like that, blood for blood, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, but he also set guidelines on how our justice should be worked out. The things that we should do. Um, the guidelines were, first of all, there were six cities spread out throughout the Israelite nation, the promised land. Six cities where that could be saving cities that were called cities of refuge. If you caused someone to die, then you could run to those cities and protect yourself. As long as you lived in that city, you, you couldn't be killed. So there was that little bit of mercy there. And you could also do the same thing by running to Jerusalem and hanging on to the horns of the altar. As long as you held on to the horns of the altar, the family could be right there to take a vengeance, a vengeance of, of what you did. But as long as you were holding on, they couldn't touch you and then things could work out. They could go through, uh, through the justice and find things out. Okay, work things out. So there were guidelines, guidelines of how to treat uh, slaves, guidelines on how to treat um, all kinds of different situations and be full of justice and also mercy because, you see, he softened it. 
he softened his commands for justice. Do not, he says in Deuteronomy 16, uh, 19, he says, do not pervert justice or show partiality. Do not accept a bribe, for the bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the innocent. In verse 20, he says, follow justice and justice alone so that you may live and possess the land of the Lord and the Lord your God has given you. That's what he says now. Now you're going to try to be just, not just have the limits on what you can and can't do, but try to figure out, because you don't know the mind of the man. You don't know what's going on. Try to figure it out. You don't know what's happening. Try to figure it out. We pass judgment so quickly these days. You know, if we're in this uh, COVID fight and battle, right? We're trying, we are told we can't attend services. We can't get together. Uh, and I know all of you have heard that the Supreme Court has said, has told California that they can't stop churches from getting together. That would be a violation of the First Amendment. So we could technically get together and do that. But the, the, county of Santa Clara, Santa Clara County said, you know what, we really aren't trying to limit that. We have not said anything about churches. We've simply said that nobody can go in and get together inside buildings. If you want to get together outside, you can do that. But you can't get together inside. And if you do get together, if you're going to follow what the what the court says, then you have to follow also the safety rules because we're still convinced that this COVID is really getting out there and uh, killing people left and right. It's just we haven't got a handle on it yet. Even though those those shots are going around, we're still not. We still haven't gotten to the point where it's not. People aren't catching it, and some are dying. So. If you want to get together, you can, but you're going to have to wear masks and we don't want anyone doing any singing. Well, what do we do in church? Like I said, we sing six songs on a Sunday morning. We can't do that? Well, then the, the elders got together and we thought, okay, we're not really, uh, we really don't feel that uh, they're trying to attack the churches. We feel that they're just trying to be safe and inspiring. Us. So we will... Adhere to that, and at a later date, when it's really good and it's open and we can get together and not feel like we're going to put anyone in danger, we will get together and celebrate that day with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind. We, we feel that that's the right thing to do. Now, if you're driving by and you happen to see some cars... And you might jump to the conclusion that somebody is meeting in our church building and we need to protect ourselves from the county and the rural, rural enforcers and, and jump to that conclusion. But just remember this, we have a treasure hunt thing on our property in Pikachu, I think it is. Pokemon, uh, Pokemon. Pokemon. Uh, Pokemon, and you got you, there's a, a Pokemon monster on our yard somewhere, and people come in and they gather around the parking lot, and sometimes it gets quite full. People sitting in their cars trying to capture this thing. So um, don't jump to that conclusion that the, the church is doing something wrong. We are not. Other people are, are there, and they're in their cars carefully catching the Pokemon. Oh, Pikachu, I said, but not not that. Anyway, so we, we have to be careful. God is asking us to soften our justice with mercy. That's how we are supposed to be. How long will you defend, he says, um, the psalmist says in Psalm 82, too. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality of the wicked? Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hands of the wicked. So we've got limits. We've got guidelines. But God wants it to be softened by mercy. Remember last week we talked about justice and mercy and walking humbly with God. In Isaiah, the first chapter, the 17th verse, learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. 
Plead the case of the widows. That's what God wants humankind justice to be. Always tempered with mercy. Always looking for the, cause, the root cause. He told the, the scribes of the Pharisees uh, on, um, in Matthew 23, he said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give the tenth of your spice and mint and dill and cumin. You are very good at keeping the, the minute things of the law, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You see, we are to be just in the things that we do. We are to be righteous in the things that we do. But practice softness and mercy when we see the needs of others. Be able to step in and help out in situations where we see people hurting on the street, in our schools. And when we see someone who is always put down and teased and, and uh, uh, attacked, we take their side. And then we try to understand what's going on with the attacker, with the bully, you might say, and try to deal with all of that. Because you see, God made every one of us, and that's what he wants us to understand. Justice is for our protection. He said in Romans, the 13th chapter, that the, the government does not bear the sword in vain. There is a reason for that sword. There's a reason for punishment. There's a reason to protect our communities from people who are violent and just think in mean terms all the time. There are those who just think. There are some who are tormented and they do things that, that struggle. We are to be able to step in and with wisdom and mercy deal with the situation. So God says there are two sides of justice. My justice is pure and swift and needs to be so because I don't want people to be destructive of one another. I want my I want my creation. I desire my creation to be a place of peace and love and joy. And it would be if we practiced the justice and mercy and love of the God who saved us all, who sent his only begotten son to die for us. If we could just remember those things, the two sides of justice would be wonderful and no one would walk around saying, it's unfair, it's unfair. No, it isn't unfair. If you've been judged by man to do, because you've done something wrong, you deserve the punishment, whatever it is. If you've been judged by God that you've done something wrong, you know you deserve that punishment. But at the same time, God loves you. God cares. God knows your heart. Just yield it to him and you'll do so much better. The world will be a better place if we accept the justice of God and the justice of man is bathed in mercy. Let's thank God for that justice. Most gracious, mighty God in heaven, help us to understand that when you mete out justice, it's always right. That everything you've done has been to help this community, help this creation become everything you want it to be the design you had for it. We just rebel. Help us to be mercy showers in all that we do. Help us to understand that we need to be careful and live lives that glorify you. Bless each one this week. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we can take time every Lord's Day to celebrate the justice and the mercy of God. All held up in this little cup and this little piece of bread. All enfolded in that. You see, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus 
recognize that we are all sinners, condemned, unclean, and that we all deserve that same kind of death that Achan had and that um, uh, others, uh, the, the, you know, all the different deaths in the Old Testament we see are just deaths. But we also deserve the mercy that God offers and can have the mercy that God offers through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Accept him as Lord. Celebrate his death, burial, and resurrection every day, every Lord's day. So as Jesus said, the night that he was betrayed, and he took the bread and broke it and blessed it and said, this is my body broken for you, observing the death on the cross. Take and eat all of it and do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for the sins of many. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, thank you so much for that beautiful example of justice and mercy and how you offer that through Jesus Christ. Justice, the just punishment of sin, fell on Jesus. Mercy, because my sin fell on Jesus instead of me. Thank you so much. If there's anyone that needs to accept you as Lord, that needs to put all this stuff aside, Father, I pray that you talk to them right now. Then I pray that they are moved to, to talk to me and talk to members of our church. Talk to each other and celebrate the fact that they make a decision for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, yes, we do invite you to make a comment and, and let us know your number. If you've made a decision of kind, some kind, you want to celebrate justice and mercy uh, as we do here. We'd love to have that. We, are, we meet on Tuesday nights. We'll be talking about this sermon and dealing with uh, more of justice and mercy here and, uh, as we've gone through the first two weeks of it. And we're going to go a couple more weeks anyway and look into the cross as we get closer and closer to, to Easter Sunday. So Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock, uh, meet, uh, meet with us at the church uh, on uh, Google Hangouts and... Um, Call me, leave a email, or leave call the church and ask us. We'll give us your phone number. We'll get you hooked up to go come into the Bible study with us. Tuesday night Bible study, seven o'clock. We love our first responders in our, in our community. We love our medical professionals on the front line of this battle, our truckers and delivery people, all our essential workers, the grocery people, and all that. And as Paul says to the Ephesians. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. See you next week.